Good morning, everyone. I'm very happy to be here this morning to speak to you, and what I've actually been asked to speak to you about is visible housing in the province of Ontario from my perspective, that of the municipal planner. And the focus is on Ontario because our various provinces and territories have different planning frameworks. So I thought it was important for this region to specifically focus on that which applies to the province of Ontario. And in terms of my presentation, I'm going to speak about these four main issues. First, uh, for you to understand what we can and cannot do as municipalities in terms of advancing visitability and visible housing, I actually have to take you into my world, and that's the exciting world of local municipal planning. Uh, I promise you I'm going to be very brief, <laughs> but you need to understand it, as I said, to understand the other slides. I'm also going to spend a little bit of time talking about the legislative framework, which guides us and tells us what we can require and what we cannot require. I'm going to speak to you about the difference about encouraging and requiring when it comes uh, in terms of the creation of policies. And then I'm going to end off talking and identifying some potential ways that municipalities can look at in terms of advancing this concept of visitability and visible housing in their own municipalities. So to begin with, uh, in terms of local municipalities, we have multiple roles when it comes to local planning uh, and land use. We are responsible for making local planning decisions, which makes sense, and also for preparing planning documents. Uh, two of the most common being the official plan, which is the long-range vision for a city about how it's going to grow and evolve, as well as the zoning bylaw. So if your official plan is your vision, your zoning bylaw actually is the precision. It has those specific details like setbacks and parking requirements, among other performance standards. One of the most important things in terms of the role of local municipality is, is that we have to ensure that those planning documents are consistent and conform with provincial policies as well as regional policies where applicable. So as you know here, we are part of a two-tier government. That's not the case all across Ontario, but there are other municipalities that are part of a two-tier government, in which case you also have to conform with regional policies. And we're also responsible, and this is also a requirement in terms of our planning uh, provincial policies, is we must engage the public and various stakeholders in our local planning processes. So what you have up on your screen, this outlines in general the legislative framework which guides the work that we do. Uh, some of you hopefully have heard of the Ontario Planning Act. Uh, this document is extremely important because it sets out the rules for land use planning in Ontario. At a very high level, it describes how lands can be used and who may control them. Um, it's divided by various sections, sections about official plans, what they need to contain, uh, when they need to be created, when they need to be updated, zoning bylaws. There's also information about appeals, uh, public notification, and processes that we have to do. Another important document at the provincial level is the Provincial Policy Statement, which was recently updated in 2014. And what the provincial policy statement is, is it provides policy direction on matters of provincial interest related to land use planning. And uh, it essentially looks at three areas, strong and built form. It looks at cons conservation and management of resources and safe and healthy communities. And in parallel to that, uh, a couple of years ago, I think about 2006 or thereabouts, the province actually passed the Places to Grow Act. And one of the implementing documents that was first passed is the Growth Plan for the Greater Golden Horseshoe, of which this region and the City of Waterloo and its other municipalities are contained within. And this document is very important because it outlines the framework for implementing the province's vision for building strong and prosperous communities by better managing growth to 2031 in this region. And as I said, uh, for here, uh, for the City of Waterloo, Kitchener, Cambridge, and the townships, we are part of a two-tier government. So what that means as well is that we have to conform and be consistent with regional policy at the regional level. That's being the regional official plan among some other ones. And what the regional official plan does is it provides, once again, policy direction on matters of regional interest related to land use planning. So then what that leads us to is, while the region has an official plan, we also are required to have an official plan. And I think we missed a slide somewhere. Sorry. Can you, uh, can you go one more? 
two more? There we go, thank you. <laughs> um, so it's important to understand uh, official plans, their roles, because uh, they're an extremely important document for land use planning. Uh, in general, as I said, they're long range, so we're looking at about 20 plus year plans. Uh, it's a comprehensive planning document that I outlines the framework for land use decision making in local municipalities. It represents council vision for how it wants it to grow, change, and evolve. And why it's very important is that all city bylaws and actions must conform to it. So it really is a very important document. It, in general, contains principles, objectives, policies designed to direct the form, extent, range, nature of that growth and development and uh, into 2031. So once again, you're seeing that connection and compliance with provincial policy, in this case, the growth plan for the Greater Golden Horseshoe, which has a time frame of 2031. And as I said, uh, the official plan must conform uh, with these provincial policies and regional policies. So if you could go back one slide, please. Uh, one more, please. Thank you. So that then leads us into a discussion about encouraging and requiring. And in order for us to require visible housing, we need requiring and enabling policy at the provincial level, and that doesn't exist. Um, the one caveat being the Ontario Building Code. Some of you actually may be aware that at the beginning of last year, uh, the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing made some updates and modifications to their building code. And it just so happens that one of those modifications is that since January 1st of last year, the building code requires all apartment buildings more than three stories in height to have barrier-free accessible features. And it just so happens that it fits the definition and those three accessibility features of visible housing. But for everything before then, and for all other housing types, particularly low-rise residential housing, that's not a requirement. Uh, my understanding is that the only accessible features required in low-rise residential housing in the Ontario Building Code right now is it's limited to visual smoke alarms um, and wall reinforcement in the main washroom for the installation of future grab bars uh, should homeowners wish for that. Next slide, please. So then that leads us uh, to the City of Waterloo official plan. So does that mean, okay, I can't require it, but is that the end of the story? Well, actually, we don't think so. We think actually that's the beginning of the story. So while I may not be able to require all builders and developers from this point on for every single housing form that is proposed and built to be visible, I can encourage it. And I'm very proud to be able to say that the City of Waterloo actually, I believe, definitely in the region, um, I think even maybe in the province of Ontario, was the first municipality to contain such a policy in their official plan. We're very proud of that. For those of you who are interested, our official plan is available online um, on the City of Waterloo's website. And the policy is actually contained in Section 3.9.2, which talks about neighborhoods. And essentially, uh, once again, in conformity with provincial policies, cities are required to plan for the provision of appropriate mix, range, of housing types, costs, and sizes, and it's gonna do that by many things. And as you can see, E is encouraging accessible and visible housing in order to facilitate ease of living, as well as aging in place. So some of the things I wanted to point out and have actually been mentioned by some of our presenters, you can see, we mentioned accessible, we also mentioned visible, because there actually is a difference, and we think it's very important to identify that. Um, as was also mentioned, usually when we have been, as a task force and as individuals, been having conversations and discussions about visible housing, people's minds automatically go to um, elderly adults and aging in place. And as has been alluded to uh, by Alan in particular, it's not just for them. It actually is, and one of our members over there, Mary, uh, has coined the term, you know, visible housing is for those from cradle to cane. And that's actually true. Um, as we were talking about, you know, if you have groceries, if you have little kids, if you, for whatever reason, sprain your foot or break your leg. So that was very important in us in drafting, um, you know, this policy to identify, yes, you know, it's important for aging in place, but we also think it's just important in order to facilitate ease of living. And on the previous slide, what you might have uh, seen, it might have been very subtle, is that the word visible was italicized. What that means in terms of the official plan is any word that's italicized is actually also a defined term. 
So if you go to our glossary, it will have definitions. And once again, this was important to us in terms of informing and educating uh, people about visible housing. And so if you go to our official plan right now, that's the definition. Uh, one of the things that I'd like to point out, it's a little bit outdated. Uh, last year, uh, based on, I think there was a teleconference call that the various task force had with the center, uh, we found that certain task forces were using some little different requirements. Um, so that definition has been updated. The three accessibility features are still the same, but I believe, for example, with the wider doorways, that uh, minimum now is 36, 36 inches. Um, and we need to clarify a little bit about the half bathroom with the turning radius uh, to accommodate those with mobility devices. And as I said, uh, Waterloo definitely within the region, and I go so far as to say in Ontario, uh, right now is the only uh, city to explicitly use the word visible housing in our official plan, as well as define it and its three accessibility features. <coughs> So what are some of the ways that municipalities can help to inform and educate people about visible housing and in general advance the concept about visible visibility and visible housing? So I've already talked to you, the main way that the City of Waterloo has done this, as I said, is uh, in 2012 when the City of Waterloo uh, Council approved their official plan, we made sure that there was an encouraging policy. Once again, I can't require, but I can most certainly encourage, and I think people um, undervalue the importance of that um, because it also does go a long way, as I said, in terms of informing and educating people. Um, not only having it as an encouraging policy, but once again, we think it's important for that definition uh, to be included as well, once again, to inform and educate people and make sure that when we say visible housing, we're all talking about the same thing. Um, in general, educating and informing, and I know at the City of Waterloo, one of the first things that we had to do is um, as staff, you know, we need to be educated in order to have those conversations. Um, not just staff, but as well as council. If you were to ask our mayor, Dave Jaworski, I actually had a conversation with him a little while ago, and I was talking about visible housing. He's like, that's housing that has it. He was actually able to identify the three accessibility features, and that's something that, you know, we're very proud of. But as I said, also for staff, so when you have team meetings, um, you know, you can have lunch and learns, but it's also very important for staff across various departments to be aware of visible housing. And I know we still have some work you know, to, to do. Um, also, I would encourage staff, when you're having conversations with builders and developers, to educate them and bring up, hey, have you, are you aware of this visible housing concept? And is this something maybe that you would consider? And also to direct them, uh, because most often you know, they're going to want some greater information. So you know, direct them to the right place. So the Social Development Center uh, Waterloo Region uh, has a great website. So does the Canadian uh, Center on Disability Studies. Um, some other things that I wanted to put, I'm, I'm not uh, where anybody's using it right now, but I know it's been used for um, other things, in particular for affordable housing. So I thought, you know what, as municipalities, I think it merits some further investigation. As a municipality, we have the ability to offer incentives. So that is something that should be looked at, and what that would also, though, involve is probably a, a greater discussion, and maybe this will come out this afternoon, what exactly it would take uh, particularly from the builders and developers, what kind of incentives, what would it take to get them to consider uh, doing visible housing? So we'd have to have a greater understanding, but the important point here is to understand that cities do have the ability to offer incentives. Um, another thing that might merit further discussion um, and investigation is uh, municipalities actually under uh, the Planning Act, Section 37, have the ability to allow something called bonusing. What it is, is it allows municipalities to offer increases in height and density of a development above and beyond that, which is currently around, allowed as of right. Um, it's not allowed as of right, right then. You have to go through a zoning bylaw uh, process. Um, and another important thing is, is there has to be policies within your official plan. So if you were to go into the city's Waterloo official plan, we have a section about bonusing. And that bonusing, um, Council can consider allowing those increases in exchange for community benefits. And those community benefits have to be listed in the official plan. So right now, if you're going to the City of Waterloo's official plan, it identifies areas where council could consider increases in height and density at the end of the day as council's decision. And then it identifies those community benefits that council would like to see. So right now, it is common in a number of municipalities. There's talk about uh, 
you know, uh, affordable housing, subsidized housing, um, underground parking above a per certain percent, uh, community art worth, you know, one percent of the total construction value of a development. There's a whole list of them, and that's a key. It has to be listed in your official plan, and those areas have to be identified. As I said, at the end of the day, it's up to council to decide if the community benefits that are being proposed merit the increase in height and or density. But as I said, it's another tool municipalities have and something that I think we should you know, investigate further. And the last thing I wanted to mention, most municipalities actually still own some land or have some land. Uh, most municipalities, I don't think, uh, or I'm not aware of, develop it themselves. Um, so if they are considering sometime in the future selling that land or portions of it, as a municipality and even actually as a you know, private property owner selling your house, you actually have the ability to put conditions on that sale. So there may be consideration of perhaps one of the conditions as councils, if you're selling land, uh, to put on there is that perhaps a couple of lots have to be built as visible. As I said, these are just tools that, uh, various tools that municipalities have at their disposal. I'm not aware of anybody who has used them, uh, but what I'm trying to uh, make the point is that I think it, it merits further discussion. I know it's often been used with affordable housing, so why not look at it in terms of visible housing and, and see if there are some options there. So thank you very much, and uh, if anybody has any questions, I think we'll be taking some questions later on, or you can always speak to me this afternoon. I'll be here all day. So thank you. Thank you.